Hi everyone, welcome back to Insecta Monday. This is Steve. We are in Tokyo now, sort of the margins of Tokyo. And so we're in a more urban environment now. Um, but we're here walking along the river in which you can see there's a lot of tall grass and vegetation. So there's lots of orthopterans, uh, hemiptera, all sorts of insects that like these sort of bushy habitats. And I was going through the grass here, this large orthopteran just jumped out. I think this is one of these uh, conehead grasshoppers in the family of Critidae. It's a pretty sizable one as well. Let's see if I can. It's quite pretty, very striking. Um, not necessarily in terms of its coloration, but its patterning. And you see the two short antennae that it has in the very large saltatorial or jumping, uh, modified hind legs for jumping. Let's see if I can coax it. See my hand. See how large this individual is. You can also see its unusual cone head. Guys, I hope you can getting a better view of this beautiful oops, critted. It's quite jumpy. Very beautiful insect. And you see just how massive those hind legs are. Very fascinating. Orthopterans are pretty remarkable in general in their different forms of mimicry patterns and how essentially at between molts, or at, after each molt, the individuals can look quite different from the previous molt. Oh, just flew there. I haven't seen an individual quite this large yet. Um, the other types of uh, Conehead grasshoppers we've seen so far are are the smaller variety, and they are a green color. You see this really beautiful individual. to be a male. Um, I 
Now there's some katydids that resemble sort of these forms, but katydids have long sort of flagellar-like or string-like antennae. And the critids pretty much have these short, kind of more robust antennae. You see how the, the head is this very interesting shape. Very fascinating insect. All right, we'll stop bothering it now. But you can see how there's these, a lot of these types of different acridids, uh, tetagoneids as well, various hemipterans in these kind of grassy, shrubby areas. Despite being in the middle of a city, uh, you can still find some really fascinating insects. Okay, everyone, continuing to walk along the uh, river bank here. One thing I forgot to mention with the acridid is that uh, and this is different for each, can be kind of different for each family of, of insects, but certainly for each order, is how they fold their wings. Um, and of course, folding the fore wings versus the hind wings can be different as well. Uh, particularly, say, if uh, it's a beetle. You know, since beetles have hardened forewings, they don't really fold them. They just kind of move them on top of the abdomen. Um, but the acridids, if you look at the fore and hind wings when they're folded at rest over the abdomen, uh, they resemble a pleated, uh, pleated fan. Uh, if you think of, uh, you know, an Asian or a Japanese fan, or Chinese fans as well, Korean fans. Um, they have pleats such that they, those pleats straighten out when the fan is, is um, unfolded, but when it folds, those pleats come together, and so it's a very compact structure. And so uh, the hind wings in particular of acridids are like that, and the forewings are as well to some degree. Uh, so it's getting a little warmer outside, and there are things flying around now. Oh, I should uh, add to that. So I say, like, um, every order folds its wings differently. So acridids are like, uh, they're pleated like a fan, but then other groups of insects, they may not fold them that much at all. Um, and beetles... For instance, the hind wings are folded in sort of an origami fashion um, in a rather complicated way that uh, some res well, various researchers have explained in various groups of insect of uh, beetles. So it's pretty interesting to see how different groups of insects fold their wings. And in particular, there's a group called Staphylinidae in the beetles, one of the larger or largest uh, families of insects. And their forewings, the called the elytra, the hardened forewings, are very short. And so the hindwings, since the forewings protect, they cover the, the uh, flight wings or the hindwings in beetles, the hindwings have to fold sort of even to a higher degree than with normal or other beetles that have kind of a normal length uh, forewing or elytron. So in staphylinid beetles or rove beetles, uh, the hindwings have an ear even higher degree of folding, which is pretty interesting. So now here you see some very tall 
uh, perennial plants. I'm not sure what these are. Um, but if you look in here, there's a lot of different insects rummaging around. Uh, one of them you see is this metallic green fly, a very small size. Let's see if we can. Oh, flew away. Those are dolichopodid flies, the family Dolichopodidae. And it landed again up there. And the common name of those are long-legged flies. And so they <laughs> naturally have long legs. And you can tell the males, um, I'm not sure which sex that one was, but the males in Dolichopodids have pretty large bulbous genitalia. Um, and that's not particular to Dolichopodids, other fly groups have that kind of feature. Um, not all Dolichopodids are that kind of metallic green. They can also be different metallic colors like reds and yellows. Uh, but they tend to be green. And you'll just see them perching on uh, foliage. Now, what seems to be the dominant insect on this really tall herbaceous plant are um, see, kind of everywhere but they are um, a chrysomelid so a leaf beetle in the family chrysomelidae and this family has upwards of maybe 35,000 species it's a, it's a quite large group. Maybe there's more than that. Maybe upwards of 40. And here, well, as the common name implies leaf beetle, they're a very large phytophagous or plant-eating group, much like the weevils. In fact, they're in a, a group with weevils, uh, as well as longhorn beetles, the Cerambicidae or, or Carambicidae or Carambicidae. Um, they're in a clade called the Phytophaga, which really is the second largest group of plant feeding insects uh, next to the, the Lepidoptera. And the Phytophaga within the, the beetle clade, within Coleoptera, just comprises three three major families. There are a few other smaller families. But... So here is a uh, larval. There's a larva of this chrysomelid. And chrysomelids can have really interesting larvae. They often, not always, but they in some groups of chrysomelids, the larvae have uh, rows of glands, defensive glands along the lateral margins of the insect. So when you touch them, they might exude some sort of noxious chemical, or they might even exude their own blood, hemolymph. Nearby, there you see the adult stage of this particular species. Kind of a, a drab uh, brown color. Like I see, they're quite common on this plant. You can see the damage caused by this, just this one species. This is the damage. You know, these are slightly fresher leaves here. Oh, and here's a, uh, on the underside of this leaf is a pupa of this species. There it is. 
get it under the shade here. And now you see another interesting feature of various chrysomelid groups. Um, and various weevils do this as well. Is you see the pupa is developing within this kind of cage. And what that is, is it's silk. There are fibers of silk that were secreted by the larva before it pupated. And so it's sitting in this little silken basket attached to the underside of the leaf. And that not only secures it to the leaf, and, well, and hides it um, because it's on the, on the uh, ventral surface of the leaf, the underside, but it, it offers some protection as well against uh, predators, as well as some parasitoids. Although most parasitoids have long ovipositors, so they can actually just stick their ovipositors through that silken mesh um, and parasitize it. And you'll see nearby there's another adult feeding in the corner of this leaf. Very interesting. These silk chambers or silk baskets. And of course, silk, uh, it, it comes in many varieties. And it's not, within the insects, it's not particular to just moths, okay, and it's not particular to Lepidoptera. Actually, silk production in its various forms can be found in most insect orders, okay. In 29 orders of insects, it's found in most of the orders, okay. You don't see necessarily long strands of silk being secreted by each of these insect groups. For instance, in some groups, they just secrete silk as kind of a glue to which the females use to adhere their eggs to various uh, surfaces or substrates. So silk comes in many varieties. It's a very interesting uh, compound or protein produced by insects. There's just some more of these chrysomelids carrying about carrying on about their day, just feeding on the leaves. Here's just another shot of a larva crawling along the stem. And then nearby, some more pupae and their little silken chambers. On this willow tree here, you'll find another common uh, leaf beetle in the family Chrysomelidae. The common name is the willow leaf beetle. And these are distributed pretty widely in the world. Pretty much wherever you find willows, this beetle has followed them mostly introduced to other countries. You see, here's a mating pair. Uh, the male is on top of the female. And you see, there's sort of a, this dark metallic greenish color, greenish blue. There is some color polymorphism, of course, in this species, like 
Um, most insects, there's some sort of uh, morphological polymorphisms or color polymorphisms. And that just means there's a variety of structures. Uh, there's genetic variability underlying the development of these structures or these colors. Just like we see variability in all uh, organismal life within species. And so, yeah, most of these are sort of this dark uh, metallic green or blue. They can be a, a lighter green or sort of uh, fairly black. And like that other leaf beetle species you just saw, they just sort of hang around, chew on these leaves. They tend to kind of skeletonize the leaves. So they will eat between the, the veins on the leaf. Let's try to find a, actually here you can see fairly good example of a let's see, skeletonized leaf by the adult. It's pretty obvious to see where the adult fed on the top of the leaf there, or near the base of the leaf. And nearby we have some larvae of this species. And they tend to feed in groups. Uh, mostly because this offers some protection and the eggs are laid in clusters so the larvae essentially once they hatch they just stay together and start feeding. The eggs tend to be a yellowish maybe orange color so there's also variety in the egg color. So you'll see once they've pretty much skeletonized this leaf, they'll move on to another leaf and go through a few different instars in the larval stage. And then unlike that other chrysomelid species we saw, this one does not produce silk, at least for pupation. They might produce some sort of glue-like silk for other purposes such as when the female lays the eggs, but the, uh, the last larval instar doesn't produce any sort of silken cage. It just usually pupates. It, it kind of glues itself at the tip of the abdomen to the underside of the leaf, and then just pupates there. So you just kind of think of these guys as little tiny herd of cows just grazing on the leaf. All right guys, just walking along here on this trail and I came across what looks to, looks to be some uh, juvenile conehead crickets, or sorry, conehead grasshoppers like we saw earlier, that, that large adult here is juvenile. You see that the coloration on this one is pretty similar to that adult we saw. So again, this is in the family of Critidae. Really fascinating body. Again, you see those very long saltatorial hind legs. Now, as near the bushes, which are just right next to this, uh, I mean, I didn't see these at all. They're, they're very well camouflaged. And 
you can see they don't really move much until they're bothered. Unless it has an eye itch, I guess. So now this individual is the brown color, very similar to that adult. And then just nearby, there was this green, green form. So you see hiding right there in the grass, extremely hard to see. All right, it's hard to see these unless they jump for you. And like many acridids, uh, when they jump, they really only fly uh, a short distance. So you see this one's just hiding in the grass, just like the other one. Oh. I don't know if you heard that, but when it jumps, it makes this clicking noise. Not quite certain how it's doing it. I suppose it's sort of typical uh, accreted type of stridulation. It's with its legs, but uh, it might be slightly different. All right, came across these two dragonflies perching here, perhaps getting a little tired from flying in this heat, uh, or maybe just perching to see if uh, any interesting meal items fly by. These look to be perhaps libellulids again. It is, that is, it's a fairly large family of dragonflies. And they're very diverse in form. It took off. There's another one. You see it bobbling its head around. Their heads are quite versatile, and they need to be, so they can move it around and sort of better triangulate where their prey items are so they can capture them. But in, in their heads being so versatile, they're also barely just kind of hanging on there. And if you've ever collected dragonflies before, um, you know, you, you'll find that their heads can sort of fall off pretty easily, um, particularly after they're de deceased. And so actually, when dragonflies are flying, and this happens with other insects as well, uh, but particularly with dragonflies, they have a head arresting mechanism where they can, where, where there are these patches of small microtrichia or small spines uh, behind the head and also on the front part of the the prothorax. So when they're flying, this, these two surfaces, the head and the prothorax, touch one another. And so it helps to create friction there, which holds the head uh, against the, the body of the insect. Which <laughs> is, you know, it's pretty funny to have a bobbly head or one that wobbles around so much that you need to sort of secure it there. I mean, I guess humans, human heads are a bit flimsy as well, but we have strong neck muscles, right? Um, dragonflies, not so much.
Oh, guys, I almost stepped on this one. Uh, this is another grasshopper, so in the family of Critidae. And perhaps, whoop. Oh, let's go see if we can find that. Gosh, guys, I can't uh, find that grasshopper again. I was about to say it looks uh, sort of more like a, a normal grasshopper would what people are used to seeing, um, as opposed to that, that cone-head grasshopper. Uh, but it was a big one. It was perhaps about as big as my hand. Um, oh, well. But there, uh, in these types of tall, grassy areas, it's a really great place for finding all sorts of different orthopterans. Um, it's actually an interesting larva and let's just turn over this leaf here this grassy leaf and you'll see this larva underneath now this is a coccinellid larva it's a beetle larva so coccinellidae is the family and that's a ladybug beetle or a ladybird beetle and they are predaceous as the adults are and you'll see the little white fuzzy things nearby. Those are aphids. And so what the larvae typically, typically do, they might be doing it right now, is they wander around, find a nice little herd or patch of aphids, and then just start feeding. You know, it's like a wolf going through a flock of sheep. So yeah, that individual there is chowing down on some nice plump aphids, which are themselves feeding on the, the grass. And the aphids are in the family Aphididae, in the order Hemiptera. Interesting thing about aphids is if you look closely at them, you'll see that they have these two antenna-like uh, spines, sort of, uh, sticking off the top of their abdomen. Oh, there's something else I want to talk about. And what those are, are they're called cornicles. And perhaps a common misconception is that those cornicles exude the honeydew or the waste product that's mostly, uh, that, that's a sweet taste, you know, that, that uh, ants tend to uh, eat. But cornicles do not do that. They secrete an alarm pheromone and so when a predator or parasitoid comes by, they will secrete this alarm pheromone to let the other aphids know something is happening that they should be aware of. Maybe so that the winged individuals can take off. So you see, among these aphids, there are these little stalks with a round or oval white structure at, at, at their end. And what those are, those are lacewing eggs. Uh, lace wings being in the family Chrysopidae, in the order Neuroptera. And so, kind of similar to these coccinella uh, larvae, or the adults as well, the lacewings or the chrysopids are predators themselves, and you'll often find them in similar habitats. Here, when those eggs hatch, the larvae will feed on the aphids, most likely, and they somewhat resemble the lady bird beetle larvae as well. Now those chrysopid eggs, 
they are at the tips of these stalks, and the stalks are threads of silk. So chrysopids produce silks uh, from the end of their abdomen, as opposed to, you know, silks can be secreted and produced in various glands in the body. They can come from sort of in the abdomen, or they can come from glands in the head called labial glands associated with the mouth parts, like in Lepidoptera. Okay. Very interesting. Anyway, I still can't find that critted. There were some other lepidopterans around here. I think they took off. Uh, they somewhat resembled, oh, here's one. They resemble Lysinidae. I think we've seen already. It's a fairly small uh, butterfly. I believe this one's in the family Nymphalidae. And so you do have some Nymphalids resembling Lycenids. But I believe this one has short forelegs, uh, such that Nymphalids do. Very pretty little gracile butterfly. guys continuing to walk along the river here and you get a sense of what the vegetation is like sort of uh, near a large urban area there's some willow trees and these very tall vegetative plants I'm not sure what they are um, <laughs> like I say they're very tall much taller than I am. Maybe three meters in height. And then you also see a lot of uh, what looks maybe wild cucumber. It's kind of a weedy species in the family Cucurbitaceae. And you, know, you often find these uh, wild cucumber, or pumpkin and such, wild squash growing along roadsides or in this case, they're rivers. And when they're flowering, uh, you get a lot of different insects coming to those flowers. Unfortunately, I think it's a bit past that time. It's, it's in sep September here. Uh, but when they are flowering, you get a lot of different things coming to them. Oh, here's some more... Uh, lace bugs, which we've seen before. They're very small, maybe half a centimeter in length. Uh, in the family Tingidae, order Hemiptera. And they're very pretty if you can get some sort of magnifying device to, to look at their fine micro sculpturing of the cuticle and they're just walking around the plant sticking their proboscis in it and feeding but when these plants are flowering one of the abundant insects that come to them are are fruit flies or pumice flies in the family of drosophilidae And as I mentioned before, that family is quite diverse. You know, it's not just that species that, or few species that come to feed on your morning orange juice or something. Uh, it has maybe around 
3,500 described species, many more undescribed. And, you know, I mentioned Drosophila or Drosophilidae because Drosophila melanogaster is an extremely important insect. Um, Drosophilas not only are important in the environment, but to humans as well. So if you're not familiar with Drosophila melanogaster, it really was the first genetic model that humans have used uh, for all sorts of genetic research. And much of the sort of medical research, early medical research, was based in Drosophila. Because you know the Drosophila genome is upwards of 90%, more than 90% similar to vertebrates or humans. And so a lot of the f research and findings that you can discover in an insect like Drosophila can be applied to some degree to humans. And so, and of course, Drosophila is still being used in thousands of research labs around the world to continue this, to this type of research. And it's really painstaking, fine detailed research that's being done. Uh, research on disease, aging, growth, organ development, you name it. And of course now there are other genetic model organisms. Uh, there's a nematode, there's a zebrafish, zebrafish for vertebrates. You know, but Drosophila was, was the first. And we've learned a lot as a, as a species, a human species, from this tiny little fruit fly. So, you know, that's another reason why insects are important. Drosophila melanogaster. Just walking here along the road, this little path along the river. And there's a nice little mantid friend. Actually, fairly fairly large mantid friend. Just sitting there. species that we've seen previously. And again, mantids are in the family mantidae. They have excellent vision. They're adept predators. Ambush predators, really. They sit and wait. individual at their eye level. A graceful insect. Okay guys, another Typical species that we come across on Cucurbitaceae, uh, and which is also has many uh, pest species in agriculture, are this Hemipteran right here. So this is in the family Miridae. They're plant bugs, and like all. Hemipterans, 
they will sit here, find a good place to rest, or, and start stick their proboscis in the uh, plant and start feeding. Just nearby, a hoverfly came by. Those are in the family Surfidae. Fantastic flyers they are, being able to hover. So hopefully, hopefully you've uh, getting a good idea of what types of insects you can find in these habitats. In this grass here, just came across two mating Lycaenids, so they're butterflies in the family Lycaenidae. Fairly small, just a centimeter or so in length. Uh, let's see if we can focus. They're mating sort of with their abdomens end to end. It's quite different from what we've seen with uh, leaf beetles or different orthoptera, those uh, acridids. Um, certainly there's different there's different mating styles, copulation styles, and this often is due to uh, sort of the way the genitalia are oriented or positioned. Within the diptera or the flies, some of the genitalia can be actually rotated during development such that the adults have genitalia that are positioned sort of 180 degrees or more, or 90 to maybe 270 degrees rotated from sort of the normal position and so then those flies would kind of mate in mate at interesting angles I'm having a hard time focusing on these guys their little banded and any black and white stripes. Now another insect that I walked past is here this kind of weedy looking plant. But you see there's various holes in the leaves. This is feeding damage. Feeding damage by what you ask? Well let's let's look. Let's see if we can find it. Whatever is causing this damage. There's another mirrored. Usually, during hot weather like this, the insects are feeding on the undersurface of leaves. Quite tiny. 
tiny. But do you see those two larvae? One near my thumb. So those are not caterpillars. They're not larvae of Lepidoptera. They are sawfly larvae. And sawflies are kind of a primitive hymenopteran group. Uh, there's sev several families. This might be in the family Tenthrodinidae. And so unlike the majority of hymenopterans that are parasitic in some way, uh, and the, the, the sort of higher hymenoptera that sting, their ovipositor is modified into a stinger. The, these primitive sawfly families are phytophagous, so they feed on plants. And they certainly resemble the larvae of Lepidoptera. Now some of them, they, they, they can be various colors, often quite beautiful. Oh, here's a, a few on this other side of the leaf. Slightly larger individuals. Uh, they can often be feeding in, in groups. Again, similar to many Lepidopteran larvae. Uh, and they can also produce various amounts of wax on their body. So they have wax glands on the surface. And so some sawfly species look whitish. Or they'll even have a very fluffy wax deposited on their surface. And that's usually to disguise themselves from parasitoids. fascinating hymenopterans, sawflies. Near the river here, on these grasses, is I think the same species of acridid or grasshopper that got away from us earlier. Those large ones. This one's not quite as large. Uh, it seems to have the same Slightly different color than the ones we've seen. This one is green with a brown dorsal surface. And again, short antennae. So I'm seeing sort of the same insects I've come across already. We might call it a day funny while while I'm walking here along the, the river along the trail you know you see various families out with their kids uh, and little nets that they insect nets that they pick up at the supermarket or the convenience store and they're out you know, searching maybe for dragonflies uh, Various orthopterans, maybe katydids. You know, it's, it's something that you don't see really uh, in the United States. Or at least I didn't see very much, particularly, especially uh, not in urban areas. You know, you don't see families out collecting insects together. It's a nice thing, or a very contrasting thing about Japan. And, you know, it's 
kind of shows, I think, their respect and maybe understanding for the insect world that I think we can all learn from. So, yeah, I think we'll call it a day here. Thanks again for watching Insectamundi. And I think I'll just leave you with the view of the river here. And I'll see you next time. I hope you've had as much fun as I did on today's little excursion. All right. See you next time. Take care.